Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here, never been on my channel, never watched any of my videos, don't know who I am. Here on my channel, I cover true crime cases and all of the true crime cases that I cover are all more on the vintage side. They're all basically 20 years or older. But if you don't know this, during the last four months of the year, I have a different theme for every single month. Last month in September, it was Solve September. This month, we are doing Oldies October, which basically means, yes, I cover vintage cases in general, but this month, they're going to be very, very vintage, very, very old. So with that being said, cue the intro. to be talking about a case that is almost a hundred years old and that is the case of little lord Fauntleroy. The year was 1921, 99 years ago, almost a century ago. The year the first baseball game was broadcast on the radio. The year that New York Yankee pitcher Babe Ruth hit his 138th home run. The year that Coco Chanel introduced the famous scent Chanel number no. 5. It was also the year the lifeless body of a small boy would be found. This story takes place in Waukesha, Wisconsin, a city a little less than 20 miles west of Milwaukee. It was a quiet little area with a population of about 20,000 in the 1920s. During the morning of March 8th, 1921 in Waukesha, Wisconsin, a man named John was taking a stroll outside of his workplace of O'Laughlin Stone Company. He was walking near the quarry pond and came upon a sight he never expected. In the pond, he spotted something floating. It was the body of a young boy. He didn't decide to check out the scene himself. He immediately ran back to his office of O'Laughlin Stone Company and notified the Waukesha County Sheriff, an officer named Clarence Keebler. Clarence Keebler then phoned County Coroner L.F. Lee. After a brief conversation, the two men made their way to the quarry pond to examine the scene themselves. The thing is, is that on February 22nd of 1921, which was only a couple weeks earlier, a man named David Roberts, who was a jailer at Waukesha, he received a phone call from an unknown man. And this unknown man told him that in the North Pond, he had stumbled across the body of a young boy. The North Pond was also known as Weber's Pond. Coroner L.F. Lee had this pond dragged and he found nothing. It is believed that this unknown caller had mistaken O'Laughlin Quarry for the North Pond and that they had actually searched the wrong pond. If they did search the right pond, they could have found this boy's body a lot sooner. They ended up searching the right one this time, found the body, and the boy was said to most likely be between five to seven years old. He was quite short, Reports say three feet, six inches tall. He had very curly blonde hair and blue eyes. His body was nowhere near decaying yet, and he didn't seem to be malnourished. He was missing a tooth on his lower jaw. He seemed like a normal little boy by appearance, but there was one thing quite odd about him, and that was his attire. He was wearing a nice striped romper, a very expensive sweater from the Bradley Knitting Company, Munsing underwear, black stockings, and a pair of nice leather shoes with white rubbers. He had on a very good quality outfit, not one a boy from a poverty-stricken or even middle-class family might be wearing. Everyone originally thought he drowned, but the coroner later verified that the boy had been struck in the back of the head with an instrument and he barely had any water in his lungs, if any. So in conclusion, his cause of death was not drowning. None of them recognized the little boy, and their main objective at this time was to try to discover his identity and then go from there. There would even eventually be a $1,000 reward for anyone who helped identify him, 
which in today's time is about $14,520. Each Jane or John Doe is given a name most often, and this name usually goes off of characteristics of the individual or possibly even the location that the individual was found. This unidentified little boy was given the name Little Lord Fauntleroy. Little Lord Fauntleroy was a children's book written by Francis Hodgson Burnett, published in 1886, and told of the story of a lavish, charming, and intelligent little boy. The name is often used to describe someone possessing those characteristics. It was a popular novel of the early 20th century and would later be adapted into plays and movies under the same title. Yet, it would never be quite as popular as the story of the unidentified little boy found in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Keep in mind that this was 99 years ago. This was 1921, and their technology was nowhere near what it is in today's time. They didn't even really have much technology. They just looked at things and were like, yeah, we think that's it. Well, they looked at this little boy's body and they guesstimated that he had been deceased for about a week to six months. But most people who look at this case now, experts, people who are just researching into it, based on the fact that he was not very decayed, I mean, they were still able to tell his eye color, he was probably there for a few weeks. Authorities looked at this little boy and figured he most likely came from a wealthy family. He seemed well-groomed, fed, and taken care of. So what happened? Was he kidnapped? Were his guardians responsible? Who took his life? What was this little boy's story and where did he come from? The news of this boy spread extremely fast and everyone was intrigued by the mystery. They were determined to solve this mystery. They wanted to find out this little boy's identity. And one of the first things that they did after they performed the first autopsy is that they put the little boy's body on display at a local funeral home. They figured that if they put this little boy's body on display at a funeral home, they could have people come in and maybe someone would recognize him. And groups and groups of people came in to view the body, some of them were very small children and no one said that they recognized him and most of the people that came in probably didn't think that they were going to recognize him they just were very taken aback by this mystery and were in awe of it and just wanted to view the body to say that they viewed the body. No one had much to say until a man named Mike Cronin also listed under Mike Coker came to authorities and he was a quarry worker, he was a pump man, and he had a story to tell them. He was actually the first person who really came forward with any information and this was their first main lead in this case. Mike said that about five weeks earlier, an automobile pulled up with a young couple in it. He said the young woman was wearing a red sweater or coat and she was crying. She was obviously very distraught. The couple asked Mike if he had seen a little boy around the age of six years old in the area. He said he hadn't. The couple then drove off in their Ford. Mike said he had been looking down in the quarry at the time and saw nothing. A tip later came in to police claiming the distraught woman later committed suicide in the same pond. They searched the pond though and their searches came up empty. It was most likely a false claim. The next bit of information came from a man named David Dobrik, not to be mistaken with this David Dobrik. Well, he was the owner of Liberty Department Store and he was almost positive that some of the little boy's items of clothing had come from his store during a sale in January. He said that he recognized some of these items of clothing. It was mostly the socks, stockings, and rubbers. He said that it was during a sale in January and it was not a part of his usual stock. It had actually come from another store that had filed bankruptcy and gave his store some of their leftover items of clothing to sell. But he didn't recognize the little boy though. Then another lead came in. This one from a man named J.B. Belson. He told authorities that the boy was his sister's son. His sister was G.E. Hormage who lived in Chicago, and her ex-husband had stolen her two sons, one age three and the other age five. Apparently, this ex-husband had threatened the two boys' lives on multiple occasions. She came to view the body of little Lord Fauntleroy, 
and claimed it wasn't the body of either of her missing sons, and both of her boys were later located all the way in New York. They were running out of options and they decided that they were going to perform a second autopsy. So they sent the body of the little boy to Milwaukee and this is where they performed the second autopsy. And while the body was in Milwaukee, they again put the body on display and they put the body on display and again, no one said that they recognized him. Money was raised by a woman named Minnie Conrad to give the boy a proper burial. And he was buried in Prairie Home Cemetery in Waukesha. He had a small white casket and an unknown person had written Our Darling on the lid. His stone reads, Unknown boy found in O'Laughlin Quarry, Waukesha, Wisconsin, March 8th, 1921. People still to this day visit his grave and leave little gifts for the boy without a name. Minnie Conrad would place flowers on the grave every year until her death at the age of 73 in 1940. Her last dying wish was to see his identity be solved and the killer be caught. Her wish never came true, and she too was buried in the same cemetery. A newspaper honored the funeral and said, somewhere, someplace, perhaps, is the mother, and some other place, perhaps, is the father. No one envies them the burden lying upon their conscience public-spirited and kind-hearted people, men of low and high, unintelligible, and even poor working girls out of the work generously contributed to the fund that made the simple funeral possible. The story of Little Lord Fauntleroy would fade in people's minds until 17 years later in 1948. June 15th, 1948 would be the very last day Cecilia LeMay's neighbors ever saw her. Cecilia was married to a Mr. Edmund LeMay. They both lived outside of Milwaukee. In September of that year, her neighbors notified authorities that they had not seen Cecilia in quite a while, and they were growing very concerned. Come to find out, her husband Edmund moved to Newark, New Jersey because of a job promotion and his wife was not with him. She was missing and he never notified authorities about this. He simply moved to Newark and purchased a brand new home with a widowed mother named Eva Clark, coincidentally a woman who used to work for his missing wife. Eva was pulled over and arrested one day for driving Cecilia's car to New Jersey. Then she was later released. But during questioning though, she told authorities that her and Edmund's relationship was not a romantic one, but that would be found out to be a complete lie. Edmund had told Eva that he was going to marry her after his divorce to Cecilia was finalized. Eva later passed away in 1950 from cancer, leaving Edmund mostly everything. When it came to Edmund, he used women for their money. He used Cecilia for her money and then he was with Eva and she basically paid for everything, including the house. He definitely gravitated towards women that he could take advantage of. When it came to Cecilia, they had no body, no proof if she was dead or alive. Edmund would later be arrested though for forging Cecilia's signature, and they asked him where his wife was. Well, Edmund used the oldest story in the book, and he said that Cecilia had walked out on him. We've heard this a million times before. When he was asked why he never reported her missing because no one has seen her, he said he didn't want to have to confess to police that he failed as a husband and his wife left him. Cecilia was not the first person in Edmund's past to completely disappear. No one knew where Edmund's son was either. In the year 1921, his previous wife, Hazel, had passed away from tuberculosis and their six-year-old son, Homer LeMay, disappeared. When Edmund was questioned about Homer, he told authorities that the boy spent time in foster homes in Chicago until he was adopted by a Mr. and Mrs. Norton. Edmund claimed that two years after the adoption, the couple sent him a newspaper clipping that told about how little Homer had been hit and killed by an automobile while the family visited Argentina. It was said that by 1948, both Nortons were deceased and could not be asked about the story. 
but some sources claim they never actually existed in the first place. Now, after Hazel passed away and before he had married Cecilia, he was married to a woman named Ruby. And she had some interesting things to tell authorities when they questioned her about Edmund's behavior. She said that Edmund was a very vicious and evil man and that he tried to take her life on multiple different occasions, one time even throwing an electrified cord in the water of a bath that she was soaking in. They divorced in 1941 and he went on to marry Cecilia two years later. And from my research, apparently he was messing around with Cecilia while he was still with Ruby. So everybody at this point was kind of on the same page, you know, a little boy, six years old, disappears around the same exact time that the body of a young boy was found in a quarry. Could little Lord Fauntleroy be Homer LeMay? On October 8th, 1948, the O'Loughlin quarry was dragged once more to see if they could locate Cecilia's remains, and they again found nothing. In 1955, seven years after her disappearance, Cecilia was pronounced legally deceased, and Edmund made out pretty well. I mean, he was granted her entire estate. In April of 1949, though, the detective captain of the Milwaukee Police Department decided to travel all the way to Argentina to see if he could find out about Edmund's claim about what happened to Homer. He did extensive research and came up completely empty-handed. He couldn't find anything about the accident or the child's death. He couldn't even locate any passports issued for either of the Nortons or the young boy. In the year 1949, after all of this came out, they were considering exhuming the body of little Lord Fauntleroy to see what else they could find out, but the people in charge of this and finalizing this decision decided that they were just going to leave the little boy alone and let him rest in peace. When you do think about it, this case is almost 100 years old, and this little boy's DNA, little Lord Fauntleroy, has never been in any database. And yes, the chances are almost slim to none that there would be a match, but you never know. I mean, if they took this little boy's DNA, put it in a database, there could be a very distant match. Now, it would be a hell of a process, somebody with a lot of money, somebody with a little bit of power, someone who really cared about the case, to try to get that done and see if they could find a match. And nobody has really tried that. And most people figure that the case is just so old that just leave it alone and let the little boy just rest in peace. And you know, it just stays a mystery. It is said though, that for many years, a heavily veiled woman, not Minnie Conrad, would visit his grave and set flowers on it. She would sometimes come and sit by the grave for periods of time. The identity of this unknown woman was never discovered, but many thought maybe she secretly knew the identity of the boy. If this is so, she took this information to the grave with her. Now there's a lot of people out there that still to this day think that little Lord Fauntleroy could be Homer LeMay. Did Edmund LeMay take the life of his wife and son? That question has never been answered, but based on the violent streak that his ex-wife Ruby claimed he had, it is very possible. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison of the post-mortem outline of Little Lord Fauntleroy and a photo of Homer LeMay, if you wanted to just look at them next to each other. There's a lot of differences, but there's also some similarities. This case, even after almost 100 years, leaves you with so many questions. Of course, the main one is, was little Lord Fauntleroy Homer LeMay? And even if he wasn't Homer LeMay, did Edmund LeMay take the life of his wife, Cecilia, and son, Homer? If he did take their lives, he was a murderer and he never faced any jail time for it and lived the rest of his life completely free until the day he died. There are some people that look into this case and think that maybe the little boy was not murdered and that he just fell and hit his head on a rock and then fell into the quarry. But of course, when it comes to his cause of death, we are going off of 
their determination back in 1921. If we did look at the body in today's time, I'm sure we could 100% determine what his cause of death was. There is one main opinion that I have about this case and I'm not an expert, I'm just saying. I think the little boy was from a different area and then brought there, whether he was kidnapped or his parents were responsible or somebody else. I don't think he was from that area and I think that's why nobody in that area had recognized him. This was a time before TV, news broadcasting, and the internet, but word did travel pretty fast in that area because they were not used to things like this happening, so everyone kind of knew about it. That is the case of Little Lord Fauntleroy and the first case of Oldies October, and if you have any opinions about the case, definitely let me know those down below in the comments. I try to read through every comment. I love hearing your all's opinions. And let me know if there's any cases that you also want me to cover during this month of Oldies October. Very vintage cases. You can leave those down below in the comments as well. Or you can email me at gabulosiscaserequests at gmail.com. And with all that being said, I will see you guys in the next one. Bye guys.